Hi everyone, and welcome to our first ever show of the Psychology of Success. My name is Paul McVeigh, and some of you might know my background in professional football. But I suppose I've always had a fascination with mental performance and psychology, and that's why we've started this show today because I want to interview some you know incredibly high performing guests, and I want to understand their psychology of why they've done the things they've done in their careers, so that we can all learn from it. So I'm delighted to say that my first guest today has had an incredible career in rugby, business, and is also a published author. So I'm delighted to say and welcome Leon Lloyd to the Psychology of Success today. Leon, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me on your podcast. Brilliant, no problem at all. My pleasure, my friend. And listen, I want to get straight into the first question that I'm going to ask all my guests every single time I'm speaking to anybody around the world. And the first question is, what is the definition of success? Well, if you'd have asked me that, my version of success, but you'd ask me that whilst I was still playing sport, which was a long time ago, it'd be very different to now. Um, I suppose when I played sport, my definition of success was winning. Uh, and how many titles could you win? How many international caps could you get? Um, but I suppose now everyone has different levels and different versions of success. Uh, I suppose about understanding what they each are. And I suppose when you're talking about winning, that, that in you know in, in my world or in the way that I understand it is really is performing. It's how do you perform at your best so that you can achieve your desired outcome? And and maybe that's possibly even a, a previous question to what the definition of success is what is success for you because if you aren't sure exactly what your success is or what you're looking to achieve then obviously that's going to be pretty difficult to go and do that but whenever you think about performance what are some of the things that really for you especially in the career that you had and, we're, and we'll go in and talk about that because i know you are quite interested in talking about your career but give us some of the reasons why you think you were able to perform at that level for so long i think consistency is, is key for um success as well you know the, the old phrase you know anyone can win the lottery but you can't yeah, it's very unusual to win it twice or three times or four times they have to back up that that successful experience be that a win but then consistently do it again and again and again. I think that's what separates a lot of people. So performance is key, absolutely right. Performance is key to success, certainly from my perspective. But having the ability to back that up, uh, and as you know, my background is team sport. So collectively, can we back that up together as a team um, over you know weeks and weeks and months and then ultimately over years and seasons and seasons? So let's let's just touch on that, Leon. Obviously, you've, you've been very high profile in the world of rugby. You know, started off at Leicester Tigers, and I think it was in 1995. But actually, you've had such a long career in rugby, which which probably is quite unusual given the physicality of it and and the demand and nature of it, the amount of injuries. And I know you've had your fair share of those. But what are some of the things that, whenever you were starting your career, you know, as a young lad coming from Coventry, what was that like to suddenly go from that background of inner city Coventry to suddenly walking into a I suppose it's only can be described as a world-class environment. Yeah, I don't really know. I think I was naive, and I suppose that helped me, the fact that I was naive, and I didn't really know what I was actually walking into. Obviously, I knew what I was walking into, but I didn't really have um, an understanding of what was expected of me. Uh, it just, the game had just turned pro back then when you said. So I was a, a young 16-year-old who just moved over, I'd say, into Coventry to Leicester to see some of these superstars of rugby. You know, the Dean Richards, the Roy Underwoods, the Martin Johnsons, and all those real superstars who I'd watched on TV. And all of a sudden, not only on TV, I'm actually looking at them, and then all of a sudden I'm sat at a dinner table next to them, and then I'm in a changing room getting changed next to them, and then they know my name, and then I'm playing the game with them. It was just surreal, really, to be honest with you. And I suppose, you know, I'm very grateful for that, that environment that I was put into. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer of your products with the environment, and being surrounded by so many elite individuals in that that you know at that same time was just great for me as a young kid. I was a sponge. I just lapped it up and I just literally just listened, didn't speak, just listened and learned from from all those great superstars. But that that's interesting because whenever I had a very similar experience, you know, coming across from from Belfast and joining Tottenham Hotspur in 1994, exactly what happened to you. I was surrounded by world class players, world class performers, and I sat next to these guys. And the first thing it probably I thought of or that impacted me was my belief, almost my lack 
of belief in what I could do and, and almost what I could, I could achieve. But did you have that belief from the start that you were going to be a success? I didn't really know. So I didn't really, you know, my, my dream, it's different if you played football to rugby because rugby was never a career choice. You know, I didn't go to school thinking I want to be a professional rugby player because it wasn't an option. And um, the game turned pro in 96. So it just coincided with me getting signed. So, you know, I had a career, I had a plan to go in, in, in to work in the, the fire service or do something in business and then play rugby on the side. So it was never really a, you know, all my eggs in this one basket of playing professional sport. And this is my path going forward. I just felt incredibly lucky that at the age of, you know, I remember 17 when I, when I sort of started getting myself established and you know, I got a car. I, got, I had a brand new car at 17 and it just, I just felt lucky. And I, I think I threw fear. From honest, if I look back now, it was fear of, having that taken away from me at that young age and knowing that all of my mate, my best mates who I played will be with in Coventry and all my school friends is able to go back to Coventry and sort of share with, with them a little bit of what I was experiencing. The fear of having that taken away from me was initially my, my driver to make sure I didn't cut corners and I put the extra effort in. And then obviously that becomes you know part of the process and you become sort of, you get caught up in the whole environment of that elite mindset, that elite team. And then it stopped being fear of losing it and then it became about and trying to trying to enjoy it, and it's quite difficult to enjoy. You know yourself. It's quite difficult to enjoy um, yourself when you're at that intense level of pressure, week in, week out. It's relentless, knowing that you know you're not always going to get picked, and you're sort of fighting for your life every week. And, and that, and whenever you say that, it it does make me think that maybe there was something that you were either thinking the way your mindset was when you were only a seventeen year old young lad, and not everybody gets caught up in it not everybody understands the relentless nature of, of either it's elite sport or working in the business world where there are so many demands on you but it seems like you're focused straight away and interest will probably come back to the whether it was fear that was driving you or that desire to succeed but did you just get swept up in all of that and almost very quickly started performing at that level I think as, as a kid, my dream was to play football. You know, I played, no one in my family played rugby. And my dream was to play football and play for the mighty Sky Blues, Coventry City. Uh, and, and, you know, and that didn't happen. I played, uh, I played rugby because I was a quick runner. You know, I was, I was always a relatively quick runner. I didn't mind getting into the odd scrap either. You know, as you mentioned before, growing up in city Coventry, you know, you, fighting was never too, too far away from me, no matter who you were. But I seemed to find myself into a lot of scrapes. So being, having that physical edge and also being a quick runner, that sort of merged those two together and sort of points you towards the career in rugby. Um, so I think when I sort of went down that path, I, ne I never doubted my ability to run quick. Uh, and rugby is a very simple game. And a lot of it is about bravery. And it's about, you know, are you prepared to put your body on the line and do the things that you know, other people might not do? And if I've got speed in my back pocket as well, um, and then I've just got to work on my skill set to get better. So I didn't really doubt my ability. I was looking around at the people I was with thinking, Oh my goodness! How now? How do I get my skill level up to these guys? And how do I? How can I be more um, dedicated? Because they were, although the game had just turned pro, that team at the time they were effectively professionals anyway. They had full time jobs before, but they trained their diet and you know their nutrition, their sleep, everything they did was around being an elite full time professional athlete. So that was alien to me. So I was on a really steep learning curve, and I, I lived with. Um, I suppose the thing that shaped me the best at the early stages. I got driven over by Neil Back, who, uh, you know, I don't, you, you will know who Neil Back is, but one of the best rugby players England have ever produced, World Cup winner and um, British Lion. And he used to drive me over from Coventry to, uh, to Leicester twice a week. So just by being in that car with him and a, a chap called Pete Lloyd as well, who, who sort of links us together. Um, he wasn't a relation, but just was from the same uh, junior club as, as both of us at Barker Burts. Just being involved in that, that car journey and just listening to the conversations and what was happening with him and his life and, I used to, I was just, as I said before, as a sponge. And then I got asked if I would consider moving over to Leicester to get me out of the environment that I was in in Coventry, move across to Leicester to try and get that mindset and, you know, the diet and the routine and the habit forming. And would I consider living with Martin Johnson? And that in itself was quite a scary, daunting thing. You know, I left home at 16 anyway, but to live with moving to Martin Johnson at, at 17, um, and then, that was, that's not the Martin Johnson we know now, the World Cup winning captain, the Lions captain, the absolute legend. He was still uh, a formidable individual, but to live with him at that such a young age when our backgrounds were so different. Um, uh, yeah, I think that definitely put me on the straight and narrow. And I think the club identified that I needed, that I had someone with potential, 
but I was also someone who had um, the potential to go a different route. So they wanted someone to be on the, the straight and the straight and narrow, be on the right track. And I think Jono uh, did that for them and did that for me, which I'm very grateful for. But that 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 must have been just the steepest of learning curves because whether it's Martin Johnson after he's won the World Cup with England and, and captained England. But even before then, he must have already been a top class performer, a top class individual. And is it just by osmosis? Was it just by being around him all the time and being in the car with Neil back that you think you were picking these things up? Because that's all well and good for you, Leon. But how do we learn from those kind of conversations and those kind of experiences that you had? Yeah, I think um, there's definitely an element of luck involved. But I, um, I try to gravitate towards people who I can learn from and people I've always done it even before rugby started I've always tried to move towards people who I can sort of benefit and learn from and just by a bit yes being by being around them but we all know famous and successful and you know hugely charismatic individuals but I suppose my mindset was about you know I want to aspire to be like those guys and they'd have training sessions and bear in mind I was an academy player at the time and um, they'd go and do a set I remember, I remember the time they had those Graham Roundtree Neil Back, uh, Martin Johnson, Darren Grucock, all these guys are going to do a special elite training session because they're all playing for England. There's little old me, 17-year-old, uh, and John would say, do you want to come uh, to join us? We're going to go and do a track session. Now, all my mates, all my academy teammates were not doing track sessions. They were students, and they were doing other things that students do. Um, but I went along and did those, did those extra sessions. And it a, yes, it was a steep learning curve. Um, and I struggled. And I, you know, for a long time, I was at the back of those the CV endurance sessions, certainly the physicality side of it. Um, but I've like been exposed to that time after time and making those right choices around food and sleep and making those sacrifices at a young age. That sort of led on to just becoming routine. So when I, I sort of stopped living with, with Martin Johnson, they were embedded within me about, you know, you've always got a choice. You know, and in my head now, even now, I think about stuff which has nothing to do with sport. I always think, what would Neil Back do? Because, you know, he was somebody who was put up on, up, up on a pedestal um, because it, his mindset was just, if it's not going to make him a better rugby player, or make the team better, then he wouldn't do it. So even now, even if a lot of my decisions I do now, family, business, and out, I always think, I find myself drifting back thinking, what would Backy do in this situation? And I, I, that sometimes, uh, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't work because obviously I'm viewing that from a physicality and rugby and training um, viewpoint. But again, it just goes to show it's instilled in my mind that we all have this, we all have, this ability to make a decision. Go that way, go left or go right. If I'm going to go right, it means this. If I go left, it could mean this. The decision is ultimately mine. But again, I think that comes from making better decisions consistently comes from the people that I was surrounded by and I was very fortunate to be exposed to. Well, I suppose because we are going live, Leon, we're going out on LinkedIn Live, on Facebook Live, on Twitter, on YouTube. And I suppose anyone who is joining us should just say welcome. Uh, my name is Paul McVeigh. We're here for the Psychology of Success. Delighted to say that former England rugby and Leicester Tigers player Leon Lloyd has joined us today. So Leon, you're just kind of bringing us up to date with almost like the start of your career, being around world-class people, whether it's Neil Back, whether it's Martin Johnson, that, that whole array of, of top-class Leicester Tigers players. So you just mentioned something there, which I think probably is is the biggest thing that probably runs through my life and that's about accountability so what does accountability mean for you now as well as how that was shaped through those early days at Leicester Tigers yeah accountability is huge for me um then in sport and again now everything I do now you have to be accountable we all make decisions we all have decisions and choices um and you stand by them uh, win lose you know succeed fail uh, you have to stand by your decisions and you know people people make mistakes and one of the things that I've developed from, from sport, again, that environment is you own your mistakes. You know, you celebrate your wins. Yes, absolutely. But if you haven't made, you make a mistake and sometimes, you know, in elite sport, you do those in a, on a, in a high profile, very visible platform, you own them. You know, you don't try and hide and shirk and point fingers. That wasn't accepted uh, in the environment that I was involved in. And I certainly don't, I don't accept that now for myself or for my, for my team that I work with and now outside of sport. So accountability for me is, a crucial and it's a non-negotiable in you know, the work that I do. So interestingly, you know, you're talking about taking responsibility for your choices and your actions. And you know, this is this is you as a young player, suddenly, you know, not only playing every week for the Tigers, but then getting into the England squad, you know, almost replacing Rory Underwood. 
And of course, you then make your England debut. Can you give us a, a little bit of, a, of an idea of what happened there? Yeah, so getting into the Tigers team, as I say, I, was, I made my debut at 17. Uh, so I suppose the path was set because if you replace someone like the legend that is Rory Underwood, I think it was the season before Rory and Tony Underwood, um, both are playing for Leicester and for England. Uh, the the, the Wafford Road, the Tigers ground, opened up a restaurant called the Underwood Suite. So the fact that they've got this this room named after them and this young skinny kid from Coventry that no one had heard of had just replaced this absolute Leicester and English and British Lions legend, um, that was tough. You know, so it, I wasn't everyone's cup of tea initially because, you know, who am I to replace that, that guy? So the pressure was on straight away. And then to sort of go through that and try and battle week in, week out, trying to get my space in the team. And then we had a new coach and I remember the game to him. So everyone was trying to find their feet. And I was very fortunate to have played England schoolboys and then played England 21s, England Colts, England um, all the way through, England A. And then I got my chance to, after a, a decent season for Leicester, when we won quite a lot of trophies, there was a purple patch we went through where we won the league, we won the Hunting Cup a couple of times, won the Domestic Cup. And my team, I say my team, it was, obviously wasn't my team, uh, but the Tigers team were, were very dominant in England and in Europe. So I think we must have made up, you know, a third nearly you know nearly half of the the English squad at the time was made up of Leicester Leicester players so it wasn't like going into an England team where you're one player from or one of the 12 different clubs straight away it was a lot easier for me because 10 of the guys in that side were my teammates so I already knew most of the guys there and I'd played against everybody else anyway so that environment was definitely a step up for anything that I'd experienced before but it certainly helped for the fact that the guys who had who I went up there with well, I'd have been there a long time, established, and uh, you know, it's it easy for me to sort of fit in with those guys and sort of find my feet a lot quicker than it would be normally. And so, again, getting on to England, and and again, you sort of mentioned about you love the physicality of rugby, which is obviously the complete opposite of what I did on a on a football pitch. Because if anyone came near me, I'd normally run fifty yards, but being four foot nothing versus your six foot four. So slight difference maybe in physicality. But when it came to that debut, England, tell us what happened with the Springbok. I know where you're going with this, Mr. McVeigh. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I, I, as I mentioned before, you know, I, 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 what I lacked in skill, I certainly made up for an aggression in my style of play. I think exactly if I just, how I describe myself, I was relatively quick. What I lacked in skill, I made up for an aggression. And, um, I wasn't. I definitely wasn't, and I'm. I'm not a dirty player, and my record would show that as well. I think I've only had two yellow cards throughout my whole career, but there was definitely a perception that I played on the edge, and I wanted that, and that's how I played. I needed to feel like I was pushing myself. And my debut against South Africa, we played against um, yeah, obviously South Africa away at Loftus versus for altitude, and I was on the bench. Um, I think it was Mike Tyndall and Mike Cat were playing, and I kept getting ready to come on. Uh, one of those guys were going down injured and I'd get the tracksuit off, get ready to go on and it just seemed like it wasn't happening because uh, I kept getting back up again and I went on with about 15, 20 minutes to go. Really tight game. You know, England never been in South Africa away, uh, in South Africa on, you know, on a normal uh, test series. And to go on that, and to, and to go on with 15 minutes to go, 15, 20 minutes to go, it was such a close game. We just had a, we just had a try disallowed by Tim Stimson. And I remember running on and seeing all these you know, all my teammates, my Leicester teammates, as I ran on, and I just remember thinking, you know, I think it was John who said, get your hands on the ball, get yourself stuck in, get stuck in straight away. And I literally did that. I ran on, and all those dreams, you know yourself, you know, you, you're an international football player. You dream of playing for your country, right? And when it happens, you don't have time to think about, I've done it. I've, just, I've, I've actually achieved that, that thing that everyone told me that, you know, you're never going to reach that pinnacle. You know, you, there's so many, so many hurdles you're going to be able to get through, injuries, anything else. When you actually run on, it was like a blur for me. I ran on, it was just like a, a weird scenario. Uh, and I got my hands on the ball early on in that, in that game and I went in, I hit my first rock, bang. And yes, they weren't lying when they said it's a step of intensity and aggression and physicality. And I got absolutely smashed. And I, got, I don't know, I've got a scar on my, on my chin, so I got kicked in the face. Um, and that's not nothing new. You know, people get kicked in the face in rugby, that's just sort of part and parcel. And, and I retaliated as, um, as anyone from Coventry would to getting kicked in the face. And, and I sort of uh, just retaliated and just threw a, a, right, a quick right jab and carried on with the game going through. And then the ref blew his whistle. Um, and I thought, at that time, I thought I could taste blood in my mouth and I could see blood coming out my chin. Um, 
And as I, look, as, I, as he blew his whistle, I looked up on the screen, the big screen in the corner of the ground, and it showed in slow motion um, me leaning over this this poor South African Springbok player on his back, uh, and just shows me punching him in the in the face in slow motion with blood and spit and everything going everywhere. And I looked like some savage animal attacking this poor defenseless player. And the reality hit straight away that, oh my God, <laughs> rewind it a little bit, show that he kicked me in the face first, at least show that bit. Uh, uh, but they didn't, it just showed that. And I'll just come onto the field, as I said just before, and the referee calls me over with, with our captain. He reaches his hand in his pocket and I think he's going to um, send me off. And my heart just literally stopped. And he came over and I think he realised I'd just come onto the field and he sort of pulled his hand out and said, any more of that from you and you're off. And the relief that I didn't get sent off um, was just un unbelievable, unbelievable. The reality is that um, I gave away a penalty. They came up, uh, Brahma Stratton came up, kicked that penalty. We ended up losing the match on that, that penalty kick. You know, it was such a close game and I'd given away a penalty and there's still time for me to change the, out, you know, the outcome of that game, but I couldn't, we couldn't as a team. We ended up losing that match. So for, for me to go from that ultimate high of, representing my country, making my debut, all those things making my family proud and, and everything else. So that devastating low of, I feel like I let myself down, my family down, my, you can see my voice is going a bit now, my team down, but also when you play at that level, you're letting your country down. That's just huge. That is just massive. And to the point that I've never watched that debut, that match back ever since that time. Just going to show it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a, a defining point in my, not in my career, but in my life. You know, that, that was a, a real low point for me. Um, but thankfully, we, I got picked again. We managed to play South Africa the following week. And we won. Um, the coach stuck by me. It would have been very easy for the Clive Woodward to not have picked me for the following week. Um, and that could have been the end of it. But he did pick me. And I came off the bench again. Uh, but managed to hold on for the win, uh, which was great for me. But still, that, that one game, uh, that one match, that one moment in time, certainly defined a lot of, shaped my, my path to who I am now. No, uh, and it sounds like it's the almost the, the best thing that ever happened, you know, coming on representing your country and the worst thing that ever happened. And it probably goes back into that whole subject that we discussed earlier of, of accountability and taking responsibility for your actions because there is nothing you can do. You have got to take that the fact that it's on you. You've they've lost the game because of what you have done. But that actually is really interesting because what I want to know, it's not necessarily the fact that that happened. But how did that shape you going forward? Well, I know, you know like resilience is, a, is a, a buzzword that people use a lot now in, in all, all walks of life. Um, so I think now when, when I go through a tough time, how I felt that, how I lower felt, knowing that the headlines, the Lloyd Cost thing and the test match, those things there, which would never go away. Um, no matter how bad a day I'm having at the office or anything else, I can think back to that and think, God, it wasn't as bad as that. <laughs> Um, you know, when you do something on that scale, like, so I think the ability to reframe things. Uh, and then I ended up writing a book around, as you mentioned at the beginning in the intro, about um, I'm an author. So I wrote a book about from bootroom to boardroom. And it's not about how, how good I thought I was or how fortunate I was to win you know, many trophies and represent my country and score tries and things like that. It's more about the, the lessons I would tell a younger version of myself and what would I do differently. Um, the ultimate high, the devastating lows, and all those bits in between. And I suppose if I hadn't have made that, up, up for, I'm not for one minute saying I'm glad I came off the bench, give away a penalty and cost my team and their country that match. But if I hadn't have done that, then I probably wouldn't have written a book about how do you reframe really dark moments and how, how I've gone down this path of, of talking about leadership, success and resilience and all those things now, because, you know, we, you know, it shapes the direction you go in. So in a way, what I've, been able to do is reframe that horrendous period in my life and it, it's, it's the end of, I know you can people say it's just sport no 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 one died it's just sport but if that's what you were wrapped up in and that's the only thing that meant that that was the most important thing to me in my life at that time that's a big thing so to be able to reframe that and be able to take positives from it and then help other people learn from it I think that I've managed to reframe that and turn it into a positive outcome as best as I possibly can and and that that whole word of reframe is is Quite interesting because I think a lot of people might have heard of that word in terms of reframe or if you haven't it's, it's just simply think about a situation in a different way and and you're saying that you did reframe it but what other way is there to think about you costing the country the match 
you kind of almost, you know, for a better phrase, messing up on your debut? How, how can you reframe that? Well, I suppose it was definitely out of character. The, the challenge I had was because I had this reputation of being, of playing the game on the edge, um, people assume that that's what I did all the time. It's like, oh, of course he did. Of course he did that because that's who he is. That's what he does. And it was, a, it was a point for me that I had to try and prove to other people, let me just preventing to myself, because I knew that was that was how I played the game. And uh, as I say, I, I won't keep pointing back to it, but I've never got red carded. I never got yellow cards. I never got, in, yes, I played, I got involved in scraps and scuffles that all part of the game. There's an element of me then for the next couple of years of trying to um, prove to the, the public, the fans, the supporters, the media, that um, that was a one-off incident. My teammates knew it was a one-off incident. I didn't want to be judged by that one-off incident. Um, and I'm sure most of the people now, I say this with, with fingers crossed, most of my teammates now who remember that back to that game probably for, have forgotten the reason we lost. You know, it's so long ago and it's probably been covered over with different wins that they've had. But for me, because it meant it was so personal to me, I won't forget it. And I won't, you know, I won't make that mistake again. And being accountable is, you know, you make a mistake, you make it, you can't make that same mistake twice. Um, so I suppose for me, how do you, how do you reframe it? I, I think it's, yeah, I'm never going to be put in that situation where I can make that mistake again. But it's about having that bit, that pressing that pause button, uh, and before I react to something, thinking about the consequences. I suppose is the best way I I could reframe that. Yeah, and, and that and I suppose that's re really we all have that option of of whatever's happening in our lives, whether it's professional lives, personal lives, things you know, many times don't turn out how they want or how we might want them to rarely. go. I suppose yeah. having that ability yeah, to reframe it. Rarely, absolutely, because <laughs> I suppose whatever we're deciding to work towards, and, and that probably just leads in the fact that this whole show and this whole series is all called the psychology of success. But in reality, failure is an option. And, and I suppose the question or a better question is, should we be encouraged to fail? Yeah, see, I'm not one for um, encouraging failure. I, I definitely buy into the the fact that I've my, some of my biggest lessons have come from losses. You know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have played uh, for a, a very dominant side. We won 11 major trophies. We were the, you know, the champions of Europe back to back two consecutive years. We had something like a five year, six year unbeaten home record. Um, so we we dominated a period of time, which was amazing. During that period of, of domination, we also lost in five finals. So, you know, if you add those up, that's 16 opportunities to be the best. We lost in five finals on the big stage. The two of those were hiding cups, so the European Cups. And those losses, I can feel those losses today. I can't remember the, you know, the wins were great and they're amazing. I remember the experience building up to it, the team, the culture, and everything else. And, but those losses, and how did we turn those losses around to make sure we didn't, we learned from those going forward? You know, I'd be lying to you if I said, I'd love to be sat here now talking to you, talking about, you know, had an amazing career, you know, 100 caps for England, 16 major wins for Leicester. Um, but the reality is, you know, I, I have this sweet and sour analogy, which is to fully appreciate the sweet, you have first have got to have tasted the sour. Now, I've tasted in sport, we all taste uh, moments of sour, but in sport, losing in finals, especially when you're the favourite and you're expected to win, that is a sour taste. Uh, so if I hadn't have lost in those finals with my team, then we wouldn't have been able to you know, be so elated when we won those other finals after them, because you've got to go to those dark places and feel that that pain, that sour, to be able to fully appreciate the sweet at the top end of the of the spectrum. So I, I'm a big believer of again, it comes to reframing. You know, if something ha bad happens, I think right, that means that when something good happens, I'm going to take that bad, multiply it by a hundred, then the good is going to be taste even sweeter. But again, I don't know if that's sport, I don't know if that's success, I don't know if that's psychology, but that's just how I personally view things. That's the lens I look through. Really, really interesting. And I should just say, if anyone is joining us now, uh, I'm Paul McVeigh. I'm here with the Psychology of Success. And we are going live across LinkedIn Live, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube Live. And it's just been so fascinating listening to former England rugby player, Lester Tigers, businessman, entrepreneur, author, Leon Lloyd is here with us today. And Leon's talking about some of the massive successes and, and then you're talking about 11 major titles <laughs> as, as a professional sportsman, which is incredible. But of course, loads of things that, that didn't quite work out as well. Now, 
I really want to pick your brains on on leadership and being around leaders and what makes a great leader and, and maybe some of the people you've been around that haven't maybe been the best leaders. So can you give us some insight into whether it's Martin Johnson, Clive Woodward, Neil Back, or even just what you were doing to lead yourself through your, not just your sporting days, but what you've done since then? Yeah, so without doubt, the best captain, the best leader I've been fortunate to play with would be Martin Johnson. His record speaks for itself, so I'm not going to spend any time talking him up. He gets enough plaudits and fully deserved. Um, but I suppose the good thing about that team that I played in under Jono, and also if you look at the England team that he captained and led on to victory and the Lions team that he captained that led on to victory, is underneath his, every team as a captain, underneath that one captain, there are a series of mini leaders. It wasn't just, Martin Johnson captained and that's why we win because we had lots of other leaders. We had, you know, we had uh, at Leicester, uh, you know, Neil Back was a leader. Uh, Darren Garforth was a scrum leader. Graham Roundtree, Austin Healy, um, you know, in the back. So I led the defence. We had, we had we had leaders all throughout and we had world-class players all throughout. It wasn't all put up on Martin Johnson's uh, shoulders. We used to joke about it because Jono's job really was to flick the coin at the start of the game to decide whether he ran out, ran left, ran right. The rest of it was down to us because we all had our jobs and it comes back to that accountability piece. So we were so accountable that when we had our video analysis sessions um, following the weekend, we didn't need somebody else to point out to us, oh, Lloyd, you dropped a ball there or you missed a tackle there, you did that and the other, because we knew we owned it, we stood up, we, we, we actually come out and we said, I tried to do this, it didn't work. This is what I was trying to do. Would I do it again? And you sort of go through those, we had these proper open, this forum where we were open, and able to um, not criticise but check and challenge each other. Whether you were whether you were Jono and you had you know eighty odd caps or whatever we got, or whether you were a young uh, academy player just coming through making your debut, you know respectfully you had the there's a platform there to be able to say you know I disagree or I think I'd do this or not you know I made a mistake here, but, you know if I had the same opportunity again I would do the same thing again, and then that would allow somebody else to come back and say well why would you that's wrong. But but they're, they're having that freedom and that flexibility to be able to talk openly in that on that platform that didn't come that wasn't there when I first joined Leicester. When I first joined Leicester, it was that very old school, the amateur era of you know you needed to play 50 games before you were allowed to talk to anybody. You know that's what it was uh, when I first joined. And then when this new influx of players come through, the the Lewis Moody's, the Paul Gustards, the the Andy Goo, the Jordan Murphys, you know these players that came through, you know the new breed, the game to professional, the coaches empowered. Um, the younger voices to come through very in a very respectful way. That's the key the key word there is respectful, respectful accountability. And that sort of breeds, you know, that winning culture, that professionalism. Uh, and before you know it, you, you know, those who don't swim in that direction stand out like a sore thumb. And if you're in an elite environment, you don't stay in that elite environment if you don't buy into those team values, that, that culture. Uh, and we had some amazing world-class people, world-class individual players that, that joined that squad didn't fit into that culture and then they went off and became or continued to be world-class players elsewhere. And that's fine. But there were some non-negotiables in that environment and it wasn't, John, people on the outside might look and think that's Martin Johnson with his big finger and his frown just shouting at people, giving out uh, bollockings all the time. It wasn't that at all. You know, we had ourselves, we were very peer-led. Our director would be, you know, the boss was Dean Richards, who was a very uncompromising character. John Wells, assistant coach, a very hard, hard man, both ex ex-policemen. Um, but very rarely do they need to dish out bollocks to people because we did it ourselves. We we sort of we could look someone in the eye and just say that wasn't good enough. And most of the time, you, you wouldn't need to say that because the person would say, "Lad, you know, I messed up there. That wasn't good enough." And that I think when you get that when you get that environment, it's amazing. Uh, my, my biggest one of my biggest regrets is not realizing that at the time because I was lucky to be in that environment. I thought that was normal. I thought this, that's what happens everywhere. It's only when you step outside of that environment, you go to somewhere else, you look back and think, wow, you know, we did that and that was just normal practice. Whereas someone would let you be, you be, everyone would be high-fiving because someone's owned up to a mistake. Well, of course he owned up to a mistake. It's his mistake. You should own it. Uh, but again, you take those things for granted if you're in those elite environments. So I, I think that's, that that's sense. really interesting. No, it does. And, and, and I think what you're probably talking about is what – you know, elite performance, what leadership, what, you know, a top class, world class team environment is like. And, and you know, Leon, both of us working in the corporate world today, you know, for the last 10 years or so since we both stopped professional sport. And, and I think that's why there's probably so much crossover because of the amount of teams that are being led 
by certain individuals or, or leadership teams. And they're always trying to improve what they do, how do they do it, what are some of the characteristics or some of the traits or behaviors that like a world-class team that you had at the time, you know, what can that be taught across to the, to the business world? But I think what's interesting is I've always thought that leadership was, whether it's a Martin Johnson, Clive Wood, whoever it is, you know, this individual who's performing at a certain level and almost dragging people with them. But maybe slightly different way to look at it is more, it's almost a process where you have possibly someone in charge, but they can, they can only lead if you have this group or following that want to go where they're going to. Yeah, absolutely. I think back to my first proper, my first proper job uh, when I finished sport, um, I retired at 30, you know, and I, I failed, you know, as, as a leader, I failed because I'd come from an environment where I knew it was successful because I you know, got lots of trophies to show that it was successful. But I was, I was exposed to a certain type of leadership, a certain type of leadership style. Uh, and my personality traits and you know i do all the psychometrics and behavioral profiles and everything else i'm a very red i'm very sort of competitive um and i suppose if you play that level of sport that sort of drive that brings that out in me as an individual and i so i i've got um proven knowledge and history that shows that that particular type of leadership works and achieves results what i didn't understand was outside of that elite sporting environment and in the you know the non-sports environment if you like that didn't work for everybody everyone's different uh, and I failed because I, you know, I remember my job. I wanted my role. I thought was to get my, I had a, an executive assistant, and I thought my role was to get my executive assistant to become the best executive assistant that they could possibly be, so that they could then become my bosses, you know, my line manager, executive assistant. So that was a career. That's my job was to make them better. Because if they're better, that means I'm be better. That's a whole team mentality. If they're really good at their job, the best they can be, then that's going to make the team look good and I'm the leader of that team so I'm going to be good we're all going to benefit from it what I realized was that they didn't want that they didn't want that career progression and I never was never involved in an environment where someone didn't want to be the best they could be where it's actually a job you know not a career so when it comes to five o'clock on a Friday afternoon down tools don't disturb me until Monday and, it, and I struggled I really struggled mentally with the fact that they wouldn't go and do the extra do a bit more how can I be better how can I how can I help somebody else in my team so I failed it down. I suppose that, that, that's what led me down this path of exploring leadership. And I went on to do my, uh, my undergraduate, undergraduate degree in leadership and management. Now, I left school at 16 because I'm pro, as I mentioned. But to understand, I, I, I sort of baffled and I was struggling to understand how this certain style of leadership, which I'd seen be so successful, was really failing. And it made me look at myself and think, well, is it me? And I kept thinking, it can't be me because I know it works. But what I did realize after I was doing, going around studying it was there are lots of different ways and situational leadership comes in and each people are diff each person's different, sorry. Um, and you know, your parents would say to you, you know, treat people as you want to be treated yourself. That was a mistake. <laughs> it's about treating people how they want to be treated. And I think from a leadership perspective, not understanding that as an individual, but learning to understand that to get the best out of somebody else, I need to treat them how they want to be treated rather than how I prefer to be treated. Um, is the best way of getting to work and achieving that collective goal but then but then i suppose that's the interesting part isn't because the collective goal might not have been set or i don't know discussed with the entire team because a lot of times in the corporate world you have a almost a target that is just forced upon you so if you're part of that team you know have you had any experiences where the people within that team don't really want to hit that target for the big bosses yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I think that, that's a key part about understanding your your team and your team members. And as a, as a leader, you need to understand what motivates each individual. Now, some of those motivations might be around money. Some of them might be around success and status. You know, it's a, so it's understanding what their personal drivers are, and and I suppose embedding that within the team ethos, the team culture, so that I know how to get the best out of this person, and that's because they need, they want recognition. It's not about financial, you know, they don't want financial reward, it's about recognition. So making sure for them to strive, what does their path look like, that they can be hit, hit those milestones and get recognized for those milestones versus somebody who, who's not really cared about, doesn't really care about recognition, they're motivated by money. So it's about how do you define a pathway so the person who cares about recognition, the person who cares about money, or a person who cares about just achieving the overall goal, they've all got their own different journeys and they all combine together so that they're overall, collectively as a team, we, we achieve that success. If you think everyone's the same as you and they all want to make the organization 
the best. They might not be you know, invested in that organization for the same reason. So I think taking that time to understand individuals is crucial. You know, in a way, it's a little bit easier in sport because why do you play professional sport? It's to win at the weekend. That's what that, ultimately, that's why you play. You, you want to get better. You want to be the best you can be. You, at the end of the day, you play because you want to win. You want to achieve things. You want to represent your country. You want to do that, you know, climb that, that ladder. Outside of sport, you know, that's not always the case. So it's understanding what the dri- personal and motivational drivers are for each individual, but then having a plan and a strategy in place that can combine all those, those good people, those great people, um, to achieve the collective, get, the collective goal. Yeah, and, and, and that's why whenever I am speaking to, whether it's, you know, a, a director, whether it's a, an MD, whoever it happens to be within the organization, and they do want certain things to be achieved, but actually the people within the organization don't always necessarily want to get it to the level that the, maybe the leaders want to get it to. And like you're talking about, it's it's probably comes down to influencing and maybe influencing behaviors. And that's why this whole world of, of psychology and mental performance just fascinates me because if you want to influence somebody, well, instead of just telling them what to do, that is one way of influencing them, but might not last very long. But actually influencing their mindset or their mentality, for me, has always been the, the best starting point. Yeah, that, absolutely. That's like transform, transformational leadership. Understanding the individual, you'd be able to understand their motives and their triggers and the things that actually get them to, to go above and beyond. You know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, I'm fortunate to go and work in a lot of, you know, um, big businesses, large big organizations. Uh, and I talk a lot about the psychological contract about what do you do in addition to what your job description says? You know, when it says nine to five, why do those people that really succeed and go on to achieve more do more after five o'clock? They don't need your job doesn't stop at five o'clock. It's understanding that those people who, I think it was Eddie Jones or somebody I read in a newspaper that said, you know, the people who, the good people do the, the things correct from nine to five, but the great ones do the good things from five back until nine in the morning. So they're doing it all the way. So they're always thinking about how they can be better. How can they improve? And I suppose it's understanding um, I, again, I go back and I sort of repeat myself a little bit by saying, what does it, what motivates me as an individual? So I'd expect my line, line manager or my captain uh, to say, well, again, okay, we've got Leon here. What drives him? What are his motivations in life? You know, at work, also outside of work, you know, that, that work-life balance. And how can I make him feel that he can go above and beyond what we're expecting of him? Because that's when the magic stuff happens. You know, we can all do the job that's written down for us and he's sort of being told what to do. That's a bit more transactional, I suppose. But when the, the creative stuff happens and people go above and beyond the uh, little bits of, of gold dust, and you know, I, I'm speaking from experience of when we achieved that, that those successes, is because we did went above and beyond what was expected of us. And that's when you get one or two people doing that, it's great. You get four, five, six people doing that, you know, you can change some some serious, make some serious serious gains. Well, if you are joining us for the last 15 minutes of the first episode of The Psychology of Success, I'm Paul McVeigh, and we are going live on LinkedIn, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And this has just been fascinating, listening to someone who's been as successful in the world of elite sport, Leon Lloyd, playing rugby for Leicester Tigers and England, as well as now working as a businessman and keynote speaker. Now, Leon, this is interesting because I know one of your huge passions in life is all around transition and it's not just when you come out of a of a sport or a a career an elite sport of coming from that into getting maybe a normal job as, as, as you might call it or i might call it but it's not just the transition out of sport into a normal nine to five what's the other kind of transitions do we have in life and also why are you so passionate about this area I think we're always um, transitioning, whether you're going from you know, junior school to senior school, from senior school to university, from university to your first job, you know, academy squad to senior squad, uh, being single to in a relationship, relationship to, to being single again. You know, we're always transitioning all the time uh, and understanding those challenges, what, I suppose planning for them and understanding that they're going to happen. It can give you a, a head start and make sure you can have an effective transition. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is transitioning to something rather than transitioning away from something. And I say that based on my sporting experience when I, when I retired at the age of 30, uh, you know, which is, you know, I, you know, I started at 16, 17, then I finished at 30, which is a long career, but I could have played longer. Like, you know, I could have gone on for another three or four years if it hadn't been for injury. But having that, that period where I was lost 
and I was so wrapped up in that, uh, that identity of being an athlete. And even though I know it was, even though I knew it was going to happen, not having something else to transition to, and I kept focusing on transitioning it away from sport. And that always, that's the anchor that holds you back. So I try again, it's reframing. I go back to looking at um, things, be passionate about, be enthusiastic about transitioning towards something and using it as a launch pad to get to where you want to get to, as opposed to, you know, transitioning away from something and sort of having that anchor. And it's a comfort, it's a comfort zone, isn't it? You, you always go back to what's comfort, you know, comforting for, for us. So that's why a lot of people, um, when they retire from something, they keep pushing themselves. And when they have that first failure, or they, they can't maintain that, they go back to the next level of where they were successful and they stay there because that's their area of comfort. And, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about pushing people to strive outside their comfort zone, but also planning, you know, plan. Uh, there's a phrase, um, plan your panic. No, when things are happening, you know they can happen, put things in place so that you can cope and you can accommodate that. So it doesn't stop you, you don't fall off the edge of a cliff. You, can, you know it's coming, you plan for it, you can go forward. And I think transitioning is, it's huge. There are some things you can't um, plan for, obviously, like the pandemic and you know black swan scenarios. Uh, but again, having the ability to reframe uh, and be accountable, control the controllables, all these little phrases which I'm sort of, I live my life by, um, help you get through those really tough times. And I think for me, having come through some tough times um, for my own transition, I, I like to help other people prepare for theirs uh, and learn from each other. You know, because I'm sure there are more tough times ahead for me and for other people as well. But by putting things in place to make those less tough, uh, then that be um, that sort of gives you that feeling of um, achievement. And one of the things I did promise everyone who was going to join us over this journey over the next few months on the psychology of success is just by listening to people like yourself that, that we can all learn from this. And and you don't have to have had an elite sporting background to come and learn from that because you say people are transitioning all the time, whether it's from one job to another job, one relationship, to another, from one country to another. So hopefully, like you said, these are some of the things you live by and probably why you've been so successful because to have the sport and career, but then how few people go on and have a career after elite sport. And, you know, you've, you have been a CEO, you've been a keynote speaker, you're an author. We, um, we have obviously started uh, bespoke elite speaker training. So do you want to just touch on that for a minute? Because I know we've only got a few minutes left. I only want to spend a little bit of time on it. But just talk us through a little bit of why you wanted to get involved in this world of training people to become keynote speakers. Yeah, so I, I didn't really, I didn't really know what a keynote speaker was when I was playing sport. I didn't really know. I, I've done after after speaking, and I've done Q and A's and things like that. Um, and then I've sort of, when I wrote my book around, you know, from bootroom to boardroom, transitioning around that. The key area for me that I was passionate about was culture, teamwork, um, success, which we talked about today, leadership, resilience, all those things which I picked up through sport. Uh, and then I was asked to go and speak at different organisations talking about those topics. And I think when we when we met Paul, we met on a on a, a program, a corporate governance program, which is probably the least sexiest program you can think of going on to uh, to go. But I think it's just both of our you know our desires to just get better and improve ourselves, and, and went on that course. And you know I realised that you were doing keynote speaking, and I I was really your area is different to mine as, as this podcast alludes to has been around psychology and success. Mine's around as I said before the culture culture side. Everyone's got a story to tell. Uh, everyone has got more than one story to tell. And it's, I learned so much from listening to TED Talks, listening to other people speak, books I read, podcasts I listen to. I'm always out there trying to listen. And some of the key learnings I pick up from people are the people that I've never even you know, heard of before and that no one's heard of. So I think what, what we do uh, through that speaker program is help people, give them a voice that they can speak anyway. They, they, again, they've done their Q&As and other things, but give them the confidence to share their story and find it, make it so it's relatable to other people. That's the thing, I think we hear, we hear lots of stories from people and you can't, uh, sometimes it's just a story, it's a nice story to listen to. And you go away and you think, well, that was a great story, but how, how can I relate to that? How can I relate to climbing Everest? How can I relate to winning five uh, Olympic medals or something like that? When, it can be, when you can flip it on its head and let me, the listener, go away and change something in my life based on what you've said to me, then it's powerful. And I think that's when it becomes tangible. And I think when you see people and help people do that, that's that's great. I love I love doing that myself. And hopefully I can I can impart some little bits of knowledge that I've picked up. But also I love it when I can see other people go away and think, right, they didn't realize that was a key learning part of their journey. But now in a room full of 200 people, half of them are going to go away and going to go and do that. And I think that's 
that's the power of keynote speaking. And that's what's why I love it. And I think that's why we sort of align together to sort of set up uh, bespoke elite speaker training. And I know that you say it's one of the, the closest feelings or closest experiences you have to walking out at Twickenham or you know just crossing that white line onto the rugby field of, of going up, stand up on stage and deliver your keynote. And yeah, absolutely, it, it is still a, a massive buzz, which is why I kind of spend 100% of my time doing it. Um, but I suppose what I wanted to understand from you is where do you think is, why can someone who's won a World Cup talk equally as expertly as someone who's maybe just had a background where they've not been a lead performer they've not started a multi-million pound business they haven't climbed everest why can those two compete on the same stage so oh, that's quite for me that's quite simple although it may not seem simple when you look at it uh initially because we've all experienced we haven't all i've not won a world cup yet I still hold out. I don't know how I have a world, we've all got a World Cup moment in us somewhere. We've got a World Cup moment in us. So to be able to relate to what, you know, seven of my Leicester Tigers teammates won a World Cup, I can't relate to that feeling of winning that World Cup. It must have been amazing. But so if, if that's the pinnacle for them, achieving something really great for them that they've worked really hard to achieve a four year program where things need to fall in place for you to achieve that, every single person in the world has a plan to achieve something and it may be in a period of time. So whilst it might not be to win, to go out and lift up the Web Ellis Trophy, um, it might be to a promotion or it might be to you know, buy a house or it might be to, to change jobs. It might be something completely different. But we've all got that plan and to be able to relate to the things that that World Cup winning team or that explorer that went to the North Pole, uh, the, the, the strategy, the sacrifice, the dedication, the attention to detail, all those steps they went through to achieve that. We as individuals, we as mere mortals that didn't win a World Cup, who have not gone to the, the North Pole, um, can relate to that by having a plan. What do, I, what, what do I need to do to achieve the first step, then the second step, then the third step, and ultimately you get to that point. And I think the power that, that storytelling has within that uh, is really, really crucial to enabling all of us to be able to take learnings from the superstars that achieve those extraordinary things, because we can all achieve them. We just need to have a plan and put things in place and just take learnings from all the things that we can experience. And and even the uh, one of the things that really stands out for me over, you know, speaking to so many high performing individuals and even people who've, you know, not necessarily had the same kind of CV or career, but the one common trait that seems to, I don't know, run rife through people who've never stood up on stage and delivered a keynote is their just lack of belief that they think they can do it. When probably I would say and hopefully you agree with us that anyone can do it. Yeah, there there isn't that there is, you know one of the fears, isn't it? One of the big fears in life, public speaking. Um it is about confidence, it's about having that that belief that you've actually got something, not just something worthwhile to say, but can I have have I got the ability to say it in a way that it can empower, impart knowledge on somebody else and yeah, I think it's confidence. It, yeah, you're right. It's belief. I think that's the, the key word. Everyone can do it. Um, it does take a bit of time, a bit of practice. But confidence is key. But I suppose that the main thing is understanding you have got some, we've all got something to share, at least one, two or three things that we can share with other people it's about putting the things in place to enable us to give us the best chance of, uh, of succeeding and sharing that, those stories. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, I want to move on from the, the speaker training and just a couple of last questions, Leon, just the bring this fascinating conversation to a close what has been the price of your success wow the price i think um i sacrificed a lot as a player and no different to anybody else i'm sure um of my team because i knew what i wanted i wanted to be i wanted to be the best player you what we think i want to be the best player in the world and when you realize you're not going to be the best player in the world, you want to be the best player you can possibly be. I want to be the best version of myself. Uh, and I sacrificed relationships and, you know, nights out, all those, all those things that, that for a normal young teenager or young 20 year old uh, would be able to go out and enjoy. I sacrificed those things to be able to achieve the things I did as a professional athlete. Now, I don't look back with any regrets at all. If I had my time again, I would absolutely sacrifice the exact same thing um, because that was the balance. That, you know, to, to achieve this, I need to give away that the decision points that we talked about before. You know, you, you need to be accountable for your for your decision, your action. So, 
I don't, I don't think I, I wouldn't change too much, even that that dreaded England debut. Uh, I wouldn't change that because I think it shapes who you are, and I think you just got to make the best of the scenarios that you that you find yourself in. So success comes success comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, so I wouldn't shape, I wouldn't change anything. I don't know if I've sacrificed too much. Everything I have sacrificed has been a conscious decision. Uh, and as I say, I feel very fortunate to have achieved what I've achieved to date, but hopefully there's a few more successes in me. So again, I know there are a lot more sacrifices to come as well to achieve. If I want to achieve them and be the absolute best I can be and win my World Cup uh, outside of playing, then I've got more sacrifices to make. So they'll all, they'll all be worth it. Well, hope you win that World Cup one day. Well, what did I say to put your second best question up first and your last question is your best? So hopefully this is it. What is your definition of success today? Um, today's been good because it's had me reflect back on lots of things which I've not talked about for a while. Um, for me, success is setting yourself a, a goal, achieving your goal without, um, for this is me speaking personally, achieving my goal without sacrificing my morals and my values. I think um, that would be for me success. It's not, it's not always about winning and losing because you're going to lose little bits along the way but the ultimate goal is how do i get there without sacrificing or or or, um, or challenging my own morals and my values that's really important to me to get there wow. brilliant leon lloyd thank you very much for your time today for your honesty sharing all those highs and lows it's it's been a real pleasure and probably something we haven't spoken about as much over over the last few months, but really, really appreciate it. And thanks very much. My pleasure. Good man. So fantastic session, fantastic interview, great conversation with Leon Lloyd there. Hope you enjoyed the first episode of the Psychology of Success. I'll be back next week on Monday, the 12th of April at 10 a.m. with the irrepressible Chris Akabusi. So hopefully you can join me then. And have a great day.